Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it would be a happier New Year if uh, we'd have kept our promise that we made a long time ago. And I guess that's why we gathered here. Uh, I have a couple uh, thoughts I'd like to share with you. But first of all, I see a lot of uh, uh, young folks, uh, young men and women in this room. I'd like to identify if you're a member of the staff, if you're the House member or Senate member, would you raise your hand, please? The reason I ask is that uh, someone who served uh, on the Hill for 12 years from 83 to 94, I, I, I respect what you do and the contribution you make to the whole process of self-government. Uh, not too many people may tell that to you publicly, but I certainly do. It was a great impact on me and what I did and, and how I was able to perform my job as a young congressman. And, and so I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad you're here because uh, our message is as much for your ears as it is for the men and women you represent. Uh, because at the end of the day, as all the speakers have alluded to, uh, the 535 individuals in uh, this part of Washington, D.C., across the street from one another, and that extraordinary building down the way can make a difference in the lives of these 3,000 men and women at uh, Liberty. And so we're glad you're here. We thank you for being here. Uh, to listen to our message. Uh, Colonel Phillips, uh, 31 years, I, uh, uh, and, he, and he takes his uh, relationship, which is a personal relationship with those uh, men and women with whom he lived and worked and served. Uh, it's very personal to him. And I must tell you in a very different way, uh, this cause has become uh, very, very personal to me as well. And I, I think you need to know why. A couple of years ago, um, eight or 10 of us on a regular basis uh, began communicating with a representative of the State Department by the name of Daniel Freed. Daniel Freed had been assigned the task of the responsibility of uh, working with the United Nations, which has failed miserably in this regard, but we're not going to talk about them, uh, failed miserably in their regard to live up to the promise of uh, securing the uh, appropriate uh, uh, safety uh, embraced by the Maliki government had failed in their responsibility to move these people from Ashraf to much safer places, had failed in their responsibility, frankly, for the longest time to simply take them off the terrorism list. But they finally off the terrorism list. But at the end of the day, we were approached uh, by the State Department. And I would tell you that it was as fairly prominent group of uh, men and women whose names you'd probably realize. There was a former Attorney General of the United States by the name of Michael Mukasey, two very highly visible, very credible and important Democratic political figures, my friend and colleague, former Democratic Mayor, Governor of Pennsylvania, Ed Rendell, and former presidential candidate Howard Dean, and Louis Free, and a couple of members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Rudy Giuliani, and the list goes on and on. And there were probably about eight or 10 of us on a regular basis for six or eight months had these conversations with the State Department, with our State Department, that allegedly represents our interest and it was looking to represent the interest of the 3,000 plus men and women at the time at Ashraf. They beseeched, encouraged, convinced us to intervene on the behalf of the State Department, our State Department, to convince these men and women to live, leave the city they basically built. And I must tell you, it is rather remarkable. The diaspora of uh, Iranians around the world had contributed hundreds of millions of dollars. They had a cultural center. They had workshops. They had schools. They built a city. There were all kinds of creature comforts. Convince them to leave that facility to Camp Liberty, which had been an American base, ironically named at the present time. Now remember, it's our State Department, and we did. And by the way, they were shown by the United Nations photographs of Camp Liberty as it existed when the United States Army had occupied it. The amenities were plentiful, the sewage system was operational, they had electricity, they had 17,000 T-walls or whatever that number may be. It was safe, it was secure, it was humane, it was a step down from the city that these industrious, enterprising, 
able, well-educated, sophisticated people had met, but they moved. We convinced them to move. When they got there, they realized that the photos were not a distortion. It was an abject, bold-faced lie. They had gutted the place. No sewage, no water and sewer, no electricity, no security areas. And they had reduced the size of the camp, almost a postage stamp, like trapped, I take it personal. Because our credibility and that credibility was on the line. And because of that, Madam Rajavi and the men and women and the leadership moved everybody but 100. And here was the promises they made. One, will make sure that the 100 people left at Ashraf can stay there because they have several hundred million dollars worth of property left there. And we're going to convince the Iraqi government to let them sell it because then they can use those dollars for resettlement purposes. Promise number one, broken. Promise number two, we'll do everything we can to facilitate the upgrade of facilities. Clearly have not done it. They have had months to do it, months to do it, have failed to do it. Third promise, we will have an American presence there on a regular basis to ensure, from the State Department, by the way, to ensure their safety and security at all times because we know, we know they're not secure there. Not only because the accommodations are god-awful, there's no security there, but because of the... They would never say it, but the mistrust, and they shouldn't be mistrustful of the Maliki government, pure and simple. So we take this personal. And we take it even more personal. Iraqi troops entered Ashraf and assassinated 52 of these men and women, many of them with their hands tied behind their back, a couple of them on the hospital gurneys as they were going to get medical treatment for the injuries and wounds sustained during the attack. Oh, and by the way, seven hostages taken, and all of a sudden nobody knows anything about where these men and women are, and six of the seven are women. Remember, it's our government promised to keep them safe at Ashraf. Our government promised them they'd be safe and secure if they'd move from Ashraf to Liberty, and our government asked some of its citizens to convince these good people to empty words tragically flawed and broken promises, and no credibility left with my government and with my State Department. I take it personal. If you think about what we've seen, ladies and gentlemen, over the past couple of years, beginning with the Arab Spring, brave journalists, print journalists, TV journalists have pretty much documented which transpired. And whether you like it right or wrong, they've been there. There's been a presence. The world community has seen its very eyes. The god-awful atrocities in Syria, we read about them, see them all the time. And by the way, who's helping them? Iran, with the support of Iraq. But you see them all the time. What two countries don't you have access to in terms of what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis themselves, their neighbors, the United States, and their own political system? Iraq, and even more importantly, Iran. Somebody asked me, is Rouhani a moderate? I said, I could believe he's a moderate when he, when he ceases the execution of political opponents, and he admits the global press, journalists, on a day-to-day -day basis, not on an ad hoc basis, come in and do a favorable interview, like a lot of people rush to do it, but they don't really ever get a full report. And so what are we dealing with now? We're dealing with an Iraqi government, and I would say Maliki is a puppet, and Rouhani and the Mullahs are pulling the strings. And I just kind of ask rhetorically, but I'm absolutely in wonderment and awe that anybody in this building or anybody in this town thinks they're going to negotiate a meaningful nuclear accord with the Iranian government, the same Iranian government that supports Hamas, Hezbollah, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that brought chaos to uh, southern Lebanon, the same Iran that sends money, weapons, and troops to support Syria, their murderous, inhumane, evil Assad, 
And I'm going to go back to the point I made at the very get-go. On multiple occasions, the United States government, through its designated, elected, and appointed officials, have made commitments to the men and women in Ashraf, have made commitments to the men and women who are their, fortunately, their voices in this country and, frankly, around the world, and not a single commitment has been met. And we promise to provide for their safety and security. Some of us take this very personal. Very personal. Ladies and gentlemen, it's another thing to be disrespected around the world. And what's the quickest way to be disrespected? The quickest way for you to disrespect somebody else is for somebody to give you their word and go back on your word. I dare say, is there anything more important to you in your relationship with individuals, people you care about, people you know, business, personally, socially, if they say they're going to do something and they fail to do it, or if they're disingenuous, don't keep their promise. I think that's the quickest avenue to disrespect and repudiation down the road. So if we want to be disengaged, that's a foreign policy decision, but disrespect is another thing. And I dare say, the rest of the world knows the promises we made to these 3,000, 3,400 at one time, men and women in Ashraf in 2002 when we disarmed them. The rest of the world knows we promised them protection under the Fort Geneva Convention. The rest of the world knows that we told Maliki, you've got to provide the safety and security. I'm hoping as much of the world knows is that they convinced several Americans to impose, use their credibility and visibility to convince them to move liberty. The rest of the world knows that they're living in a concentration camp. And the rest of the world knows that even Secretary of State Clinton promised that they'd be safe and secure. And the rest of the world knows, as of today, as of March 12th, 2014, the United States of America has failed miserably to keep its word. And if you don't keep its word to political refugees who have surrendered their means of self-defense to you, how much credibility do you have in the broader world community on other issues? Oh, I know you don't know these 3,000 people, and it may just be a blip on the screen compared to the number of people getting assassinated and murdered and tortured and killed in Syria and elsewhere around the world, but uh, none of those people did the United States government pledge to provide safety and security. So to the men and women who are on respective staffs, we share this insight, this perspective with you. If you have an opportunity to engage your congressman or senator about this critical issue, at the end of the day, the fate of these Individuals rest in the hands, not of Maliki, but in our hands. So I think maybe we ought to just discontinue aid for a while, put a little pressure on him. I think we're going to negotiate with the Iranians. We ought to send them a signal that uh, once we make a commitment, we keep it. Let's get them out of there. Let's open the doors to a couple of them here. It's not a matter about being disengaged. It's about being disrespected. And as long as we fail to keep our word, there's no reason in the world why anybody should ever expect, could ever rely on American promise again. Thank you very much.